The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember that every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Boomerang. It's been three months now since the career of the doorbell killer ended in a blaze of newspaper headlines announcing the execution. The case was a strange one. Some thought his motive was robbery. Some thought otherwise, but no one ever knew for sure. But the most important feature of the case wasn't mentioned in the headlines. It doesn't even appear in the police records or in the accounts of the trial. It will never appear anywhere. Because the only two people who know of it aren't in a position to testify. It's the story of Amy Clark and a husband named Ralph who grated on her nerves. At first, he merely bored her. But after a while, her boredom subtly changed into something more dangerous. She found herself trying to find a way to leave Ralph without leaving the comfortable home, the healthy bank account, and the insurance policy. And oddly enough, the rise to prominence of an unfortunate individual labeled the doorbell killer by the tabloid had a direct effect on Amy and her problem. It started one morning as Ralph sat at breakfast going through his usual routine with a newspaper. Give me a little more coffee, will you, honey bun? Hmm. Look at those headlines. Wonder if they got that guy yet. That's enough. Holy smoke, he's done it again. Second time. Listen. Fleeing from the scene of his second murder, a man alleged to be the so-called doorbell killer fired two shots at a patrolman in the Twin Oaks district last night at 11 o'clock, then eluded the police dragnet around the area. Well, good Lord, Amy. Twin Oaks. Well, that's just over the hill. Hmm. Patrolman Joseph Grimes had seen the man acting suspiciously on the porch of a house at 320 Green Street. He was unaware that within the doorway lay the body of Mrs. Mildred Norris, the Slayer's second victim. Evidence indicates Mrs. Norris, like her predecessor, answered the door only to meet a similar fate. Amy, you've got to be careful. Who knows what this guy's going to do next? <laughs> So you tell him you'll be careful, Amy. And he gives you the usual dutiful peck on the cheek, turns in the hallway at the exact spot he always turns, and you wait for it. Well, so long, honey bun. Don't take any wooden nickels. See you in the funny paper. How many times have you heard that one, Amy? And how many times must you hear it again? You think about it all day as you go through your routine. And finally, in the afternoon, you get a chance to relax by the radio. Patrolman Grimes reported that all he could see of the killer was a dim shape, a heavy-set man about six feet tall vaulting over a low stone wall in the distance. A small metal tie clasp bearing the initial R found near the scene is a possible clue to the criminal's identity. Chief of Police Henderson suspects the killer is a familiar figure, possibly a resident of the Twin Oaks neighborhood. 
since in both cases he was apparently recognized and accepted by the victim who opened the door. It's more than just an unpleasant news item with Twin Oaks just over the hill, isn't it, Amy? That night, Ralph comes home a little early before dark, and you'll notice he's carrying his thirty-eight pistol. There's an unhealthy suspicion through the neighborhood, a feeling that perhaps your next-door neighbor might be the guilty man. Ralph is tense and worried through dinner, and afterwards, during the usual routine with the evening paper, he skips his customary comments on the stock market. Well, according to this, they couldn't find the bullet. But from the size of the nick in the patrolman's leg, they figured it was a 38. <laughs> I don't care what you say, Amy. I'm still going to pack this little pistol of mine. And if that bird ever shows up around here, I'll have the welcome all ready for... Stay where you are, Amy. I'll go to the door. I'll give this guy the surprise of his life. <clears throat> what do you want? Uh, well, uh, I'm Haley, evening bulletin. Working with Chief of Police Henderson on the doorbell case. Just checking the neighborhood. Oh, well, it's good to know the police are on the job. But you seem to be on the job, too. Hmm? Uh, that 38. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Well, I'm not taking chances. Uh, yes, I understand. Got a permit, I suppose? Sure. Uh, 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 what's your name? Ralph Clark. Oh, Clark. Uh, how long have you been in this neighborhood? Three years. Uh, wife? Yeah, Amy. She's back in the kitchen. Okay. Uh, look, have you seen anyone acting suspicious around here last night or tonight? No. Where were you at 9 o'clock last night? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Haley. Did you say you were a reporter or a police investigator? I told you I'm working with Henderson. Isn't that good enough? No. You better run along, Haley. I've answered enough questions. If the chief of police has any more in mind, tell him to send one of his men in uniform. Any particular reason, Mr. Clark? Yeah. One reason and a good one. I have no intention of standing at the front door telling my life history to any reporter who happens to come along. Okay, Mr. Clark. Keep your door locked and be careful when you open it. That's all. That's when you began to think about it, Amy. As you stood back at the kitchen door and watched Ralph talking to Haley, the man from the evening bulletin. Ralph was jittery, almost suspiciously jittery, wasn't he? standing there answering questions, the gun in his hand. And later that evening, when the doorbell rings again... Stay here. I'll go. <gasps> oh. oh, Mrs. Gibson. That gun. What are you... Well, anything wrong with the gun? No, but I... All right. Maybe if more people had guns, these things wouldn't happen. What are you doing out this time of the night? Well, I... I just came to borrow a cup of sugar from Amy. I... Come on in. Well, just a minute. George, it's all right, George. I had Mr. Gibson watch from the window. Funny time to be borrowing sugar, if you ask me. Is Amy... She's in the kitchen. Oh. Well? Aren't you going to get your sugar? Oh. Of course, Mr. Clark. I'll only be a minute. I'm sorry. I... It's all right. Get your sugar. <laughs> It struck you again as he stood talking to Mrs. Gibson, didn't it, Amy? Nervous, jumpy, rude to her. Of course, it's fantastic. You admit that. But it's something to think about anyway. And perhaps a remark or two to Mrs. Gibson the next day as both of you go outside to hang up the washing. Uh, just a suggestion, a, a remark that slips out accidentally. Mrs. Gibson, after all, is always interested in her neighbors. She might see fit to pass it on. Here's your mail, Mrs. Gibson. A couple of magazines, too. Thank you, Postman. Sorry I jumped when you rang the doorbell. Oh, I'm getting it from everyone these days. I swear my husband George is going to break down if this business keeps up much longer. Hmm? That awful man's still at large. Yeah. Oh, hello, Mr. Clark. How are you, Mrs. Gibson? Very well, thank you. I say, uh, I, I wanted to apologize for the way I acted last night. I was... Sort of on edge and... I see. Worried about Amy and all. And you know how it is with this doorbell man running around the neighborhood. Well, uh, I better be getting home to Amy. See you later. Home early, ain't he? Yes. Yesterday, too. Pretty jumpy. Do you think so? He seemed to be. 
You know, I think the worst part of the whole affair is what the paper said about the man being a resident around here. About him being recognized by the victims just before yeah, he... Yeah, yeah. Can't trust anybody. You're right at that. For example, that tie clip with the R on it. Huh? Might even be him. R for Ralph. Oh, well, now, I don't know Could that. be, couldn't it? Six feet tall, heavy set. Oh, lots of people are six feet tall and heavy set. And carry guns? Same kind of gun the killer carries? Huh? He has one. He was carrying it right now. I could see the bulge in his pocket. Oh, now, Mrs. Gibson, it might have been something else. It's a gun. Amy told me this morning. You don't say a thirty-eight? Yes. Says he's carrying it on account of the knifer. Hmm. You won't mention this to anyone. Oh, no, no, you can trust me. Amy said he began acting queer just before the first one happened. Yeah? Says that lately it's gotten so he... He scares her. Told me so just this morning. You couldn't miss it, could you, Amy? A heavy set man, six feet tall. The initial R, the 38 pistol, the announcement by the police that they would shoot on sight. But even so, it's still an experiment. There's nothing solid enough to count on yet. But three nights later, after the gossip has had a chance to circulate around the neighborhood, something happens that is solid. And that's the night you and Ralph go over the hill to Twin Oaks, to the Walkers for bridge. At 10 o'clock, Harry Walker comes in from the kitchen. Sorry, folks, the bartender's up a stump. Yeah, out of ice. The old refrigerator ain't what she used to be, and guess we'll have to take them warm. Oh, gosh, that's a darn shame, Harry. Suppose I go home and get some, huh? You mean they got refrigerators in your neck of the woods? Why not? <laughs> no, 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 forget it, Ralph, old boy. In another hour, oh, you won't care whether they're hot or cold. Right, Amy? Hey, now, wait a minute, Harry. Isn't there an ice machine down the street a couple of blocks? Hey, there is it there. Forget all about it. I'll get down there. No, right no, now. no, let me, Harry. I've been wanting to get some air. So Ralph leaves for the ice machine. And because it's warm in the house, you walk out on the porch and stand in the shadows. Yes, it's still an experiment. You'd noticed a kind of forced cordiality toward Ralph at the party, a a subtle undercurrent that would never penetrate that thick skin of his. Nothing subtle ever did. Then, as you stand there thinking, you notice a man walk up the stairs to the porch of a house a few doors up the street. There's a pause. The door opens. There's a sudden movement, the flash of a knife. <laughs> Everybody, wait. You may as well sit down. Did you see it, Harry? Uh, just over there. Yeah, but did you? Yes, I saw her. She's right where he left her. The police are in there now. I don't think yes, him. I can't stand this any longer. They're doing all they can. May I come in? Well, it looks like a party. Who's the host? I am. Well, I'm Haley, Evening Bulletin. What's your name? Harry Walker. Well, is it a party? Yeah, I had a few in for bridge. Well, friend, I'd send him home if I were you and tell him to stay there the rest of the night and lock their doors. Uh, they all here? Yeah, I think so. Hello, Harry, old boy. Well, here's your ice, man. 25 pounds. <laughs> the darn machine's haywire. Slammed the ice on my finger. I got a little blood on it. Hey. What's the matter with everybody? <laughs> With the prologue of Boomerang, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But first, I want to thank all you friends who helped make January the biggest month in all of Signal's 14 years of growth. Bigger even than pre-war midsummer months when travel sent gasoline sales soaring. Yes, the recent swing to Signal has been terrific. And I think I can tell you two reasons why. The first is that great new Signal gasoline in which chemists actually rearrange the atoms in gasoline molecules to create amazing new power. 
power that makes today's vintage model cars feel young again with quicker starting, faster pickup, and smooth anti-knock performance. Even when you're taking the steepest hills and high, power that gets so much extra efficiency from your motor, you actually go farther than ever with each gallon of new signal gasoline. Well, that'd be reason enough, wouldn't you say, for today's swing to signal? But there's another equally important reason. If you're already trading with a signal dealer, you know it. If not, I'll be back later to tell you about it. But for now, back to the whistler. That did the trick, didn't it? Changed it from a vague idea in the back of your head, from an experiment in creating suspicion to a solid plan to end your marriage in such a way that you'll manage to hold on to Ralph's house, his bank account, and the insurance policy. Somehow, Ralph manages to explain it to the police, shows them the defective ice machine, convinces them he actually did cut his finger when the ice dropped down. But the suspicion remains much stronger than before. And the town is aroused to such a pitch by the third killing in Twin Oaks that the police and the people are ready for anything. The next day, after Ralph has left, you visit Chief of Police Henderson. And a few minutes later... Did you see her, Chief? Yeah, Ely, I saw her. She's out there now. Well, what about it? I don't know. Sometimes I think she knows what she's talking about. Sometimes I think she's just a dizzy dame who's got the jitters like everybody else. What are you going to do? I don't know. I checked the neighbors. They seem to think she's on the bay. The papers are screaming for an arrest. Mayor called me this morning. I think you've got a case. I don't. You know, it's funny. I had a feeling Mrs. Clark was holding something out on me. Yeah? Something she was afraid to spill. Like what? Well, that's just it. I don't know. She told me after they got home last night, she saw her husband go into the kitchen and boil a knife in caustic soda after he thought she'd gone to bed. Huh? What do you mean? That's it, so help me. You think the guy could be that stupid? He leaves a party in a house full of witnesses, kills a lady three doors away, comes back with blood in his hands and a nutty story about an ice machine, takes his wife home and goes into the kitchen to boil out the knife. Uh, what's wrong with that? Well, would you do it that way, Haley? Well, no. Neither would the killer. I still think Clark is your man. Well, you've been right before. The guy's jumpy as a cat. I thought he was going to pull the trigger the other night, so help me. Well, you're going to get a chance to find out tonight. You're going to run him in? Yeah, just for questioning. But if his wife is right, he'll come out fighting. He's still carrying that gun, you know. Yes, yes, I checked the license. For some reason, she's afraid he'll try to kill her tonight. Oh? Yeah, now here's the plot. Sergeant Ransom's taking her home, letting her out a block away from the house. Now, she'll go in and try to get his gun. If she gets it... She'll raise the front window shade. But if she doesn't, she'll open the front door. That's pretty game of her. Well, she says it'll be easier that way. I think she's right. Now, what if she can't get the gun? Then Ransom goes in shooting. Well, there's a story in that for me. I think I'd better be out there, Chief. That's fine with me. We need all the help we can get on this case. <laughs> I'll sharpen the carving knife. Anything to get dinner on the table. I'm just saying there's no excuse for you staying at a hen party till after dark. Especially now. Check that front door, Amy. Be sure it's locked and then come back here. I don't want you fooling around the front end of the house. Darn fool women. No wonder they get it going. <laughs> What's that? Amy! Amy, are you all right? Amy, I'm coming! I'm coming! I do with that gun. The drawer. Here it is. I'm coming, Amy. Okay, brother, I... Oh! oh. Well, you were right, Mrs. Clark. Did I get him, Haley? You sure did, Sergeant. I'd better call the coroner. <laughs> So, you think we can close this case, Haley? I don't know why not, Chief. The guy came out shooting just like she said he would. Yeah, with a knife and a sharpening stone on the floor of the kitchen. Yes, he was sharpening it when she got there. Hmm. Heavy set man, dark suit, initial R. The 
gun, a knife, and sharpening stone. It all adds up. Yeah, that's the trouble. Huh? It adds up too well. Comes out even. I've never been on a case in my life that came out exactly even. Oh, now, wait a minute, Chief. She he... was holding something out of me, Haley. What makes you so sure? Are you sure she isn't? I think so. I hope you're right. This is your evening reporter, ladies and gentlemen, with another last-minute news roundup. According to the latest statement from the office of Chief of Police Henderson, the case of the doorbell killer is not quite ready for the closed file. According to Henderson, the case against the late Ralph Clark was entirely circumstantial, and had the man gone to trial, the state case against him would have been very rickety. The fact that there is no living witness to any of the killings is the biggest point in favor of Clark. Henderson's statement naturally raised a furor amongst the city hall boys. Well, Amy, it came off almost perfectly. The house is yours now, and the bank account and the insurance policy. You're proud of yourself, aren't you? You chuckle at Mrs. Gibson's sympathetic understanding and chuckle harder at Mrs. Gray down the street who snubs you as the wife of a murderer. It won't make any difference in a week or two, will it, Amy? You'll be relaxing in Miami, forgetting all about the dull little city and the dull little people in it. Meanwhile, the case is still a little unsettled, and you decide to settle it once and for all. So you make another visit to Chief of Police Henderson's office. Now that Ralph is gone, it won't make any difference. I saw her again today, Haley. Uh, who? Mrs. Clark. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we can send the case to close file. Oh, well, how come, Chief? Oh, I'll give you a statement for your paper in ten minutes. I'm satisfied now that we got the right man. You see, the case against Clark is no longer circumstantial. What do you mean? There was an eyewitness to the third killing. Wait a minute. An eyewitness? Yeah. I knew she was holding out on me. She was standing on the porch of the Walker house during the bridge party. She saw the killer walk up to the front door three houses away. Say, that is something. Do you think she could identify him at night at, at that distance? She says so, and I believe her. She says it was her husband. Why did she hold out? Afraid. Oh? Satisfied? I don't know. Maybe. I think you're making a wise decision, Mrs. Clark. The real estate market is tops right now, and 15000 cash is a good price for your house. We'll follow your instructions and have the draft sent to the Florida State Bank. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Clark? Yes, we've done just as you requested. Converting the endowment insurance to cash will bring you slightly less than $20,000. Right. We'll have the check forwarded to the Florida State Bank. That's 185.60, one-way mainliner to Miami, including excess baggage. Your plane leaves tonight at 11 o'clock, Mrs. Clark. So you're all ready to go, aren't you, Amy? Your bags are packed in the living room. The house is sold. The airline tickets are in your purse. And there's over $35,000 in cash waiting for you in the Florida State Bank. It was a neat job, wasn't it? There wasn't a hole in it. Not a loose end. You're waiting now for the taxi that will take you to the airport. And then promptly, at half past ten. Hello, Mrs. Clark. Haley, evening bulletin. Remember me? There was a loose end, wasn't there, Amy? And a million questions hit you at once as Haley comes in and closes the door, smiling confidently. Haley, ace crime reporter. The man who cracked the Jenkins case almost single-handed. And he knows. You can tell it by the look on his face. You made a mistake, Mrs. Clark. A big mistake. You never should have said you were on that porch watching a guy that night at Walker's. It was a dumb trick, Mrs. Clark. You should have been sitting pretty if you hadn't opened your mouth once too often. <laughs> Just try to wrangle out of this one. <laughs> The 
Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here's that second reason for today's amazing swing to signal. The first, you'll recall, is that great new signal gasoline. But equally important is the more thorough, more conscientious service your car gets at independently operated signal stations. A typical of this is Signal's double-check lubrication service. And why is it called double-check? Because each part is checked not just once, but twice against Signal's lubrication chart, which shows every lubrication point and specifies which of Signal's nine specialized oils and greases each part should have. That signals way of making doubly sure that not a single lubrication point on your car is ever overlooked. No wonder signal serviced cars stay so happy and last so long. Now, wouldn't you say these are two mighty good reasons for today's swing to signal? More conscientious signal service geared to keep today's aging cars in the running. And that great new signal gasoline that helps you enjoy peak performance from your car while you go farther than ever per gallon. And now... Back to the Whistler. Well, Amy, the walls are tumbling down all around you. You forget about the money in the Florida bank. Forget about the 11 o'clock plane. All you can think of is the slip you must have made somewhere. The statement to Chief Henderson that you were a witness to the third killing. Even though the man was nothing but a shadowy form to you three houses away. Somehow it caught you up, Amy. Somehow it brought Haley to you just as you were about to leave. You stand there, petrified, wondering. Then suddenly, you see something in Haley's eyes you never noticed before as he slowly walks toward you. You were gonna leave town. You were gonna take a powder, weren't you? Well, that'd never do, Mrs. Clark. Wouldn't do to have a loose witness floating around the country ready to spill the beans whenever she felt like it. No, I wouldn't like that at all, Mrs. Clark. There are just two people who know who the doorbell killer is. You and me. That's one too many. I gotta fix that, don't I? Chief Henderson of my newspaper wouldn't like it if they knew the guy with the knife was... Me? (laughs) Yes. It's been three months now since Richard Haley... The doorbell killer was executed for the murder of Amy Clark. But the most important feature of the case wasn't even mentioned in the headlines. It's the story of a vicious, conniving woman and a husband named Ralph who grated on her nerves. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen, based on a story by Nancy and Alfred Seal, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>